Hello and welcome to the Educators Corner podcast, the show that brings you conversations with educators from all over the world. Conversations where we stay curious for just a little bit longer. Conversations where we're talking about the challenges and the opportunities which we are facing in our schools and in our communities. So, whether you're walking, running, cooking, or just relaxing, I hope that you're ready for a compelling conversation with today's guest, Mark Steed. Mark has a tw- 22 years of experience of leading top UK and international not-for-profit schools as both principal and CEO. And Mark now supports school groups, schools and school leaders in a number of areas, particularly related to mergers and acquisitions, new school ventures, whole school strategy, digital strategy, transformation and cyber security. So Mark, welcome to the show. How are you doing? It's great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Well, I'm delighted that we found a space in our diaries that we could have this conversation. Um, And so up until summer 2023, you'd been a head teacher for 22 years. That's quite, quite a remarkable feat. Now, what we do here, sort of, when we're speaking to our colleagues who are who have gone into retirement, that actually head teachers can be quite, they can we can find retirement quite difficult. How are you finding life after headship, Mark? Well, it isn't retirement. I, I've set up uh, our own company, and uh, you know we're really enjoying doing that, and it's nice to be working with schools. So we've you know set up Steed Education as, as a consultancy business with the name of supporting school leaders in a whole range of ways. Um, I love the variety of it. It's it's great being able to work from home a lot of the time, but it's also wonderful to be in school. Um, I've been in school for the past couple of days and it's just been lovely, you know, and going into school lunch and, you know, seeing people and having on-site meetings and doing work on site is, is still a great, uh, get a great buzz from that. So I think it's great fun and uh, I'm enjoying lots of bits of the job. Um, Obviously, it's very different. You know, I haven't got, I'm not managing lots of people. Um, And I've and obviously, I I haven't got direct responsibility for students anymore. But it's, uh, it's great to still be involved. Brilliant. And uh, fantastic to see you smiling and looking so well. So today we're going to be talking about the teacher recruitment crisis and whether this is actually a looming crisis or maybe is it a wonderful opportunity for innovation. So let's jump straight in, Mark, and uh, let's explore the first elements of this crisis. Let's look at the data. And I'm just going to read out a a few facts, first of all, uh, just to get us uh, into the, the groove here of this issue. So let's start with England, first of all. Uh, And this year, England faces a significant shortfall in the number of trainee teachers, with only 13,102 out of a targeted 26,360 registering for secondary teacher training places available. Those figures from the Department of Education. And it would seem on current trends, probably at least a third of those trainees are likely to leave the profession by 2030. If we then expand out further into the international sector, where I am currently working in Mark, where I think you spend the last uh, eight years of your career as a head teacher, in the international sector, uh, in the next uh, four years, so by 2028, according to ISC research, we're going to need another 158,400 teachers in the next four years. And then if we zoom out even further, uh, and look at all education systems around the world, according to UNESCO, by, by 2030, we're going to need 44 million additional teachers globally. So it would seem that we have a situation where, as some of us in our schools, we are struggling to recruit teachers, or if we're not struggling at the moment, we're at least worrying at a point fairly near in the future where we are going to struggle so mark in your experience you know that's the data but is there a crisis how is this impacting on schools on a day-to-day basis would you say 
I think it's definitely impacting on schools. I mean, if you take the situation in England, I don't think we've had a majority of physics lessons being taught by a specialist physics graduate for, for something like 10 years. Um, it really, you know, acute crisis in, in physics, in mathematics. So we've got non-specialists having to flex across uh, biologists typically teaching physics up to GCSE, um, non-mathematicians being brought in to teach mathematics. Um, so it isn't just a numbers, a total numbers game. Um, it's, you know, there's a different picture. I mean, there's lots of PE teachers, there's lots of classics teachers, if you look at DFE data. But, you know, we have a massive shortage in the sciences, mathematics, economics and business particularly. These are very, very difficult to get qualified teachers who have actually got the experience and, and the ability to teach A level. So I think there there is a real crisis. And then, as you've pointed out, Kai, I mean, going abroad, um, you know, a lot of people moving abroad, the massive expansion of British and English speaking education around the world, huge demand for English speaking education, lots of opportunities to travel there. But it is, again, exacerbating the situation and you know, there's a massive shortage. And I think the big issue for international schools is, you know, supply, you know, supply uh, in terms of you know, where, where are the next generation of teachers going to come from? And what do we do when teachers are ill and how are we going to, you know, where do we get that in that sense of supply? How do we get supply teachers? Yeah, I mean, certainly in my own school uh, this year, actually in the last few months, uh, we've struggled over the last two years to recruit um, a, a German teacher. And uh, and so actually we've taken the decision with the board over the last two or three months that we're going to phase out German over, over the next couple of years because we just, we find it so hard to recruit German teachers. And, and that's not, not just in German. Uh, I mean, we're actually recruiting for French and Spanish at the moment. Not got a great field for that in terms of volume. Uh, PE surprisingly already this year is is not usually an issue but that that seems to be a bit of an issue at the moment so when i speak to head teachers in different parts of the world some of them will will say yes i'm experiencing what you're experiencing kite some will give give you more more serious cases of how difficult it is to recruit but there are others who say actually there doesn't seem to be a crisis. Now, I'm not sure if they're maybe trying to recruit primary teachers, because certainly, again, we've just advertised for a couple of primary teachers, and we've had well over 100 applications. And if you look at the trainee data, it, it does seem that maybe there's less of an issue at the primary phase than for, for secondary specialists. Is, is that your experience, your understanding? Well, the, I, I think the other thing with primary teachers is that they're, they're, there's a greater flexibility in, in the year groups they can teach. So, I mean, in fact, it's very good professional development for, for teachers to teach a different year group or to teach a different key stage. So I think that it's there is the ability to flex teams and recruit and move people around in order to fulfil gaps. Whereas, you know, if you're looking in the senior school for a physics teacher or a chemistry teacher, you're, you know, there isn't the ability to flex into those subjects in quite the same way. Yeah. Right. So certainly for, it would seem, a large number of schools, this is already a serious challenge and an issue. Uh, it does look from the data that we've been, been shared with us as head teachers for the last few years, this is going to get worse and worse. So why then? Why... Mark, are we in this problem? Why can we not attract enough teachers into the profession to meet the opportunities and the vacancies that, that we have? What's going wrong? Well, I, I suppose it breaks down into two two bits, doesn't it, Kai? I mean, you know, it, there's, the re, there's a recruitment piece and a retention piece. Um, on the recruitment piece, things have changed so much from when we joined the profession you know, I mean, you know, we've, we're quite long in the tooth these days. But, you know, when we joined the profession, you know, schools had, you know, a, a lot of holiday and, you know, a lot of flexibility compared to people in other professions. But we're now in a situation where because there is a lot more flexible working, a lot more working from home, uh, young graduates look at other professions and they get much more freedom, much more flexibility 
going into other other professions than being required to be at school five days a week you know for set hours so i think this is going to be a real challenge going forward and i i often dob my son in here because my, my son has only he's been working for three years in the city in the city of london and he has only been to work three times on a monday and once on a friday he's also changed jobs during that time and negotiated exactly the same working conditions of going into work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So this is becoming the norm in a lot of professions. Um, and you, know, you compare that flexibility that's being offered there to what we're, you know, we're doing with our sort of rigid hours, whether it's you know, sort of in the state sector, a sort of set number of 16, 25 hours and so on, or whether it's set hours and, you know, certainly in international schools, independent schools, people are asking people to go beyond, work longer, do stuff at weekends and so on. It's going to be a real challenge to get people across the line to come into the profession. Yeah, so that's that's really interesting, isn't it? That, like I say, when, when we joined the profession uh, some, some way back in the, the late 80s and uh, we we had maybe five or six weeks holiday. Uh, I used to be, I guess, quite embarrassed or made to feel embarrassed when the summer holidays came and my my friends and my my, my people I knew or the the, the neighbours. Oh, you're on summer holidays now. Yeah, you're right. You're a teacher. You've got these long holidays. And now that now that conversation's turned completely on his head. Is it like, well, I'm 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 a teacher. I've got the long holidays, but. I can't work from home. I haven't got that flexibility. Yeah, it's okay. You're working in the city. You can work from home. You've got that flexibility. You don't work on a Friday. Um, okay, so that it's really interesting, isn't it? Since COVID, really, that that we've seen that change in society, and now, like you say, that really puts teaching globally at a competitive disadvantage because, at the moment, not many of our schools can offer that flexibility which much of society or em- employees in other parts of society are now experiencing. Um, do you, like a number of people in this conversation, would blame the government or would blame the main- mainstream media um, in terms of the, the sort of comments that have been coming about, out about teaching over the last 20, 30 years? Would you, would you blame politicians mainstream media for how they portray teaching and they have been portraying teaching well i, I think it's it, it, it's a bit of both really i mean you know as a profession we need to behave like professionals and there have been times you know when you know schools in the uk haven't behaved in in quite that way um and i i think also the demands being placed on on education are increasing all the time um, you know, it's, it's a well-documented story about Ofsted and the impact that Ofsted is having. Um, but at the same time, you know, schools and teachers on an individual level need to be accountable for their performance in the classroom. So it's, it's a very challenging environment, I think, for teachers, certainly more challenging. When we joined, it was a much gentler place. I mean, you know, uh, we we worked when we joined the profession. There was there was no Children's Act. You know there was no very little safeguarding going on. You know there was there were no inspections. There was there was you know the the national curriculum and only in GCSEs were only just coming in as as I was starting teaching. So it was a very it was the start of the change, and that change has kept going, um, and that accountability. Uh, is is probably a good thing. I welcome it personally, but I think some people have found it quite demanding. Let's go from the statistics and um, so sort of wondering why we are in this crisis to starting to look at solutions, and let's maybe start at the sort of the system level. Um, and let's start with the international sector, where I said, you know, you've spent the last eight years of your, your time as a, a head teacher and school leader, and I've been spending the last 13 years nearly. That what inevitably happens to expatriate teachers when, when they move abroad to teach, many of them at some point are then, for whatever reason, very often personal reasons, they need to go back to the UK. And you touched upon this issue 
in a very profound way in a letter that you wrote to the Times uh, not so long ago, back in May 2023. And I'm going to read out this letter in a moment. And this letter, I think, is, is quite interesting. I mean, we're both quite active on LinkedIn. Uh, but when you, when you post this letter on LinkedIn, I think you've got over 1,000 likes and over 100 comments and 57 reposts, which is quite unusual. Uh, so let's read the letter and then let's, uh, let's think about this as a solution and, and wh why maybe this, this letter uh, caused or generated so much engagement from colleagues around the world. So here's the letter. Sir, very respectful start, Mr. Steed. Sir, the government's scheme to encourage teachers from abroad, extra 10K to woo more teachers from abroad, refers to another earlier article, is understandable. However, it is targeting the wrong audience. There are thousands of UK trained teachers working in British schools around the world, attracted by a sense of adventure or the lure of low tax incomes to get a housing deposit who wish to return home to the UK at the end of their sojourn overseas. One of the things I have found remarkable is the di difficulties and prejudice these colleagues encounter in gaining posts when they're trying to return. British international schools are some of the highest performing schools in the world, subject to the same standards of inspection and rigour as UK schools. The government should learn lessons from the Republic of Ireland. The Irish Department for Education Skills recognise, uh, recognises up to seven years international experience on its pay scales for returning teachers. In practice, many of them timed their return so as not to lose this benefit. The government's £10,000 might be better spent implementing a similar system for returning Britons. Mark State. So, first of all, Mark, why do you think that letter, when you posted that on LinkedIn, generated such a high level of engagement? Well, I think it really struck a chord. I mean, you know, I was I was quite surprised by you know how how much and how how many people wrote on the comments and told their stories of their struggles to to get a post back in the UK. And I, I think it does come down to quite considerable prejudice, you know, it's, and, you know, there are also practical difficulties as well of coming back for interviews, but, but those two are linked. I mean, you know, if a UK principal says that you've got to be back for an in-person interview and teach a lesson in, you know, in my school in front, with my kids, then that's a huge barrier to sort of re-entry back into the UK for somebody working abroad and uh, and it's you know schools in the UK are really you know cutting off their noses to spite their face here because there's an incredible talent pool working abroad I mean I, I spent four years working in Dubai and in that four years you know I I oversaw eight inspections in uh, across the two two different exam centres that I had so I mean, every year, schools in Dubai are effectively having an Ofsted inspection. And there are thousands of teachers there who are incredibly equipped to come back into the UK state system. They're incredibly equipped in terms of dealing with a whole range of issues which people need. Like, I mean, they've got phenomenal experience of dealing with EFL. Uh, they're on the whole, because the schools are well resourced, they're very good with technology and they're very advanced in, in, in their pedagogy and using technology and so on. So really strong pool of resource here. And I think, you know, the, the state sector in the UK is really missing a trick. And that really came through when people were talking about their experiences and the prejudice that they, they, they felt and experienced mm. um, if they actually managed to get an interview. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I remember back in the early 90s, in the early stages of my career, uh, I was toying with the idea of teaching internationally. And um, I remember colleagues in my school at the time were saying to me, oh, if you do that, Kai, you'll never get back into the English system. And it was sort of made to feel that even thinking about it uh, felt like a sense of, a sense of betrayal. Um, and it seems like some of those attitudes still prevail, which, like you say, is, is very unfortunate because 
you know, if you speak to anybody who's taught internationally or led internationally, you build up a whole another set of experiences, perspectives, uh, which actually enrich your your professionalism. I think as a teacher and as a leader, and it's a it's a shame, isn't it, that when there is this crisis, uh, which is maybe hitting schools in the UK even more severely than some schools in the international sector, that you know it would seem like a simple solution to well, if we're going to offer ten thousand pounds for teachers returning or coming to the UK who are not UK trained, there's a whole army of untalent pool of teachers who would have, have been trained in the UK, have got another breadth of experience, could add a lot to inter- uh, UK schools, and you know, why not give those, them a £10,000 relocation allowance? So I think you, you had an interesting conversation about this with a, with a politician around, uh, just shortly after this letter was published. Do you want to share us, share us that story, Mark? Yeah, well, I, I think to his great credit, uh, Nick Gibb, who was at the time the schools minister, um, got in touch and said, you know, he clearly the letter had been in the Times, had obviously picked up quite a lot of traction on LinkedIn. And, you know, asked me for a call. And um, I had, you know, a a very, I think, productive uh, 30 minute call with uh, him and his team, Um, in which time I I sort of shared my ideas about what sort of things the British government could be doing. Um, And I think I think, you know, I, I really boiled down to three three suggestions, which were the first one was to run an awareness campaign for UK principals and head teachers about, you know, quite how good these schools are. And I think that, you know, if your school has got a sort of British schools overseas BSO accreditation, then it really should be treated on a level playing field with schools in the UK. And I'm, I'm not suggesting every school internationally should be treated in this way but but a bso is, is is a kite mark it is a government kite kite mark so i suggested this was a fairly useful badge for us and that actually to to sort of try and overcome the practical barriers as well to encourage different modes of interview for example allowing video conference interviews and to allow video recorded lessons of teachers to evaluate their performance rather than requiring them to come back to the UK to teach a lesson was I think a really first thing so this the awareness campaign was my first point and then the second one was really to actually actively try and recruit international teachers back to the UK and it makes sense I think for them to run you know if you ran for example a an education fair in Dubai as a hub for the Middle East or in Bangkok as a hub for for Asia or Singapore or somewhere similar, then then the British government could actually say, look, we want to welcome you back. These are the pathways back. I mean, there is actually a section on the website, on the DFE website, about getting back into the UK and doing it. But this is taking it to the next level. It's actually actively going out there and saying, this is it. And then effectively identifying a pool of people who could come back and be recruited back into the UK. And and I think making people feel loved, and I think that's a really important thing, and I think would be a very relatively cheap thing for the British government to do. And then the third one, and I alluded to it in the letter, is really to sort of put a mechanism in place to recognise the experience that people have who are working abroad. So, I mean, the Irish government allows seven years seniority. So if you, you know, if you effectively go out on on point two, you could come back, you know, on one of the higher threshold uh, points f- based on your experience working abroad. Um, and I think that's a very positive aspect of what the Irish do. Um, and it obviously, I mean, I've had people leave, you know, uh, when I was running Jess to go back to Ireland because they just, they, you know, they'd got to that seniority, they'd had their time abroad. Mm-hmm they'd saved up and got their deposit for their house and done what, you know, they'd sort of, you know, got their wanderlust out the system and they wanted to go back home. And and that was part of the catalyst was they could get back into the Irish system with open arms, you know, if they came back, you know, pretty much the end of that seven year period or within that seven year period. 
Um, I mean, all of this is great, and actually, it's very well received by Nick Gibb. But um, sadly, he was reshuffled out of his government role a few weeks later, and uh, unfortunately, I think that's where it where it sits. But I, I still think the ideas stand, and I think they're good ideas. And uh, you know, I really hope that someone like Damien Hines will take them forward, because I think that this is a solution to the UK recruitment crisis. It is. It, it sounds like a very relatively simple fairly low cost uh, solution and you know why why wouldn't a country which has got a teacher recruitment crisis and it has hundreds of thousands of teachers dotted all over the world many of whom would want to come back or need to come back at some point why wouldn't you do that and i guess maybe sort of building on that idea and maybe you know the idea could be part of a a, a broader strategy i don't know what you think mark but I mean, I, I've spent a few days in China. Uh, a few years ago, I had, had the privilege to visit China and take part in an education conference. And, and what became really clear to me from that experience was that in countries like China, teaching is considered a noble profession. I'm not sure if it's considered like the most noblest of professions, but it's certainly considered a noble profession. And, and I wonder whether within the UK, whether within Europe, whether, whether you know, across the world, we were able to reposition teaching, certainly in the UK, as a noble and also a global profession. And maybe the global bit, you know, if we can't create schools where teachers can work flex- flexibly, but we're going to come back to that at some point in the future, uh, but if we can't create schools where teachers can work as flexibly as other professions at the moment then maybe the the attraction is that teaching can be very realistic a global profession for many many people who who want to go into it and cobus have done a lot of work over the last few years on on surveying you know uh, the data around this this teacher recruitment crisis and also coming up with possible solutions and and the cobus uh, reports do talk about you know one recommendation is you know repositioning teaching as a global profession where it's actually quite normal to you do you do some training in the UK you maybe work in the UK for a few years then you maybe work abroad and then you come back to UK and then you go abroad again and and it, and it's a, a cyclical pr- profession which has a really exciting international dimension to it and a noble profession and do you think if that's the media politicians, governments were able to position teaching as a noble and global profession that might help recruitment? Definitely. And I I think there's something very exciting about having, you know, a period of time working abroad. And, you know, when I was running Berkhamsted, we looked at opening a, uh, a branch in Malaysia um, and we really weren't doing it for the money. Um, we were doing it for educational reasons, to provide student exchanges so that uh, the uh, Berkhamsteadians could have an experience of what it's like to, to live and study in Asia. And also for, for staff to have the opportunity to flex and spend some time working in Kuala Lumpur. And I, I still stand by it as a vision. I think it's a phenomenal vision for a school to to actually have an annex overseas and to have an exchange of students, you know, in two two directions and an exchange of teachers in two directions. Um, when I first came into the profession, um, it was quite common for for there was a Commonwealth Teachers Scheme, and it was quite common for teachers to. To, to swap and go and work in Canada or Australia and New Zealand particularly um, and go and do a year there. And it, you know, because I was working in boarding schools, it, it, it was all facilitated and worked very well for the schools. Um, we were in staff accommodation, people moved into our houses and so on. And this was a really common thing. And I was always missed out because I was a religious studies teacher and they didn't have these you know, religious studies at the same level in in the commonwealth as the, as we did in the uk but but a lot of colleagues did it and it was a very you know, it was a absolutely enriching experience for them professionally um that the world's moved on a little bit i don't know whether the commonwealth scheme still exists but but the opportunities to work abroad 
uh, and go abroad and do two, three years, I think are still there. Um, and I think it's a very exciting thing for people to do. And some people do it, you know, in order to get, as I suggested in the letter, <laughs> some do it to get to get a mortgage together, because that's really difficult for young teachers to get onto the housing ladder. Uh, or young people generally, but teachers in particular. And you know, some people go abroad in order to to sort of see the world and and use the teaching to travel. And I think they're both, you know, and you'll have encountered that, you know, in, in Muscat with with your teachers. You know, some will be there, you know, because of the the, the tax regime and the, the salaries, and some will be there because you know it's part of a life experience that they want to have. Um, and I hope we can get back to that sort of high vision that what you're you're talking about a noble you know vision for for it for education um it is you know it is a noble profession we do one of the most important you know, jobs in society we you know we we're in the future business we prepare young people the next generation we're bringing them through um we should be respected within society and um and behave you know yeah, and, and you know, it's two way really. We have to behave in a certain way and you know, and conduct ourselves in a certain way, and and then I think we we should be seen by society and indeed remunerated by society for for the important work that we do. In your experience, Mark, you know, we've we've talked about you know maybe our own schools are, are experiencing the impact of the shortage. What what are schools doing? Uh, to try to weather this incoming storm. Um, what are schools already doing in response to this teacher supply crisis? Have you come across any interesting examples? Well, I think, I, think, I mean, it's multi-led. I, I think, you know, I think you and I have been very fortunate. You know, we've run some of the best international schools around. And, you know, we've, and we've been able to put money into salaries and benefits, you know, for staff to... to to remain competitive um, within the the context in which we were working, um, but I do, I do think you know the the sort of generation the younger generation of teachers are much more focused on professional development. I mean, one of the things you know over the past five years or so is the the, the way in which interviews have shifted from you know effectively the candidates selling themselves to try and get into the school to to, to it's sort of being a bit more of a two-way process where the school's got to in a sense sell what it can offer to the individual candidate in both in terms of remuneration and package but also in terms of professional development opportunities and indeed progression you know career progression and I think those are very important things. So I think having you know, a mechanism in place where you can give people opportunities to progress in their career, but also develop their, their professionally uh, opportunities to, to study and take on responsibilities in, 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 a, in a way that is, promotes their career and, their, and works with their ambition. So I think we need to sit down with, with individual teachers, and I spent a lot of time doing this, you know, both Jess and at Keller, talking about where do people want to get to? What stages do they need to take along the way in order to get to that, the next stage of their career? What training did they need to do? What experiences did they need to have? What responsibilities did they need to have done that would qualify them for the, for the next promotion? Absolutely, and, and you know, one of the areas which that can then lead into is that we can actually grow maybe teaching assistants into high level teaching assistants into actually qualified teachers and uh, we've done a lot of work in the last seven or eight years on growing our own teachers as part of our response to this this the challenges faced by teacher recruitment and, and I'm really proud that in that in that period so the last seven eight years we've actually grown more than 20 UK qualified teachers and I just I just wonder what you think Mark you know could could or if more schools were unable to do that if it was easier to to get the infrastructure in place in your school so you could train up uh, teachers to become UK qualified is that part of the response could that be a systemic response to the crisis oh. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I think the government, uh, you know, this week have announced you know, different 
you know, uh, measures in order to put apprenticeships in and, and bring people through that route. I think the, you know, the, the sort of IPGCE, the IQTS schemes are really important. Um, there needs to be quality assurance about it. But I mean, these are these are really good schemes. And I mean, you know, for you, you guys to have produced 20 teachers is an enormous testimony to your school. I mean, that's that's great. And if, you know, if every school grew their own like that, that would, would go a long way to solving the problem. There are some solutions which could help us address uh, in schools and in education systems across the world the global teacher recruitment crisis. But it does seem that just by looking at the data and listening to schools' day-to-day -day experience, that this is a pressing issue that requires attention and innovative solutions. So Mark, we're going to leave it there. And, uh, and I think we can come back to this and really I think we'd both like to explore some of the uh, innovative solutions, the flexible working models, the alternative forms of education provision. I think we'd probably like to explore that in more depth at a later date. But um, before we say goodbye, uh, we have a tradition now on this show. This is our sixth episode. On, uh, we normally end with a quick fire round. So... I have six questions for you today, Mark. Are you feeling up to the quick fire round? Okay, quick fire round. Okay, quick I'm fire ready. Round. Okay, so <clears throat> answers cannot be longer than one sentence. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Question one, the biggest leadership lesson that you keep on having to learn? You can never communicate enough, particularly when managing change. Absolutely. Uh, question number two, the key moment in, or a key moment in your leadership journey that made you think or lead differently? Uh, I think moving abroad and encountering very different contexts, different people, different models for education, different price points in education. I think that, that got me thinking a lot and I think that, that was transformatory. Okay. Thirdly, What's your favourite way to unwind at the end of a busy day as a consultant? Uh, walking the dogs or... I'm really enjoying watching a lot of live sport, which, having lived the other side of the world, I wasn't able to do for, for a number of years. So, uh, yeah, probably and, those two, walking the dogs and sport. And do you get to see much of West Brom these days? Sadly, yes. Sadly, yes. <laughs> OK, leadership is... Uh, I've always liked the um, the Harvard Business School motto, which is leadership is about making others as a, better as a result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence. And I had it on the wall of my office at Kellett. Fantastic. OK, getting deep now, just before we get to the end, the purpose of education should be to... Uh, equip young people people in our care so they can make the world a better place very good uh being a head teacher you'll you will remember this i'm sure even though it was <laughs> what eight nine months ago when you when you yeah, no, finished not... so being a head teacher is one of the best jobs in the world because you can shape the context where young people grow and develop Fantastic. And it is. It's a, it's a wonderful job indeed. So thank you, Mark, very much for being on the Educators Corner podcast today. Uh, we've had a really interesting conversation about the global teacher recruitment crisis. I think it's something that we're going to come back to again and again and again, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I think, and maybe you might agree, Mark, it is an opportunity for innovation as well as being a serious cause for concern. Definitely. We're going to have to. There's no alternative. OK. It's been a great privilege to be on. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks, Mark. And uh, we'll see you at somewhere around the world soon. You've been listening to the Educators Corner podcast, the show that brings you conversations with educators from all over the world. The podcast where we stay curious for just a little bit longer. The Educators Corner podcast is hosted by me, Kai Vasher, and produced by Stuart Pardo, Zoe Snell, and Marion James, and 
by BSM BSS Productions.